So we'll start there in verse 18, in Numbers 25. It says, For they vex you with their wiles, wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of pure and the matter of caused by it. The daughter of the prince of Midian, her sister, which is slain in the day of the plague for pure sake. So what I want to focus on there is the matter of pure. What is the matter of pure? Let's just get a little bit more context. So back up to uh, Numbers 24, starting in verse 10. 24, verse 10. And the Bible reads there in Numbers 24, 10. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together. And Balak said unto Balaam, I call thee to curse mine enemies. And behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor. But lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad in my own mind. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. And now behold, I go unto my people. Come therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. So uh, Balak of the Moabites um, wanted to hire Balaam to curse Israel. Okay? He sees this, this, this troop of Israel, this great people that come from um, out of Egypt a number of years ago. And here they are. And he wants to curse them because I guess he's worried about you know them you know ruling over them or them defeating getting defeated in battle. And he says he he was he had thought to promote him unto great honor. And what does usually come with great honor? In, in the world, it's usually great wealth. And, and Balak is saying, you know, even though Balak, Balaam was saying, if Balak would have given him his house full of silver and gold, he couldn't say more than what, what God had told him. He, he couldn't curse the children of Israel. In fact, but the problem is, Balaam was so eager to go with him because he's got this promise of, of honor and God did tell him, he says, if they call you in the morning, then go with them. Well, he doesn't wait till they call him. He gets uh, saddled up his donkey in the morning, he, and he leaves right away. And I think you're all familiar with the story how the angel is there ready to kill him, and the, and the donkey moves out of the way, and he, he, he gets mad at the donkey, and the donkey actually talks. God made a miracle happen. And Balaam, I think, is somebody you could call a covetous person. And Three times, you know, you think after the first time you get the picture, no, God's blessing these people, and he tries in a different spot. There's another, you know, whatever, seven bullocks on seven altars or seven lambs, whatever, you can read the story and see what the sacrifices were. But three times, and no, each time it's a blessing, it's a blessing, it's a blessing. And, and Balak is getting mad at Balaam, and Balaam is probably seeing all his chance of reward is, is going away. But, we do know that he, he was greedy of a reward and he didn't he wasn't able to get it through cursing. So what does he do? He gives Balak advice on how to defeat Israel. Now in numbers it doesn't doesn't say that, but if you read further on in, in different parts of the Bible, it actually tells you that that's what he did. And we can see in Numbers 25 how he does start to defeat Israel. In Numbers 25, 1, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. So this, they're abiding there, and the people start to commit whoredom with each other. But the, the, the men are committing whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And after all these miracles that God showed them, you know, in Egypt, first of all, the plagues and so on, and all the miracles like going the Red Sea parting and, and all these different things that, that the peop people of Israel saw, and now they're going to go, they're going to commit boredom with the daughters of Moab, and they're going to bow down to their gods, and eat the things sacrificed to their gods, which we know are devils, the idols, uh, are actually have a demon associated with them, and any other god that's not the real god is a demon. 
And it's, it, verse 3 says, And Israel joined himself unto Baal for, and, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So they're, like, they're basically becoming one people. Like the, the, the children of Israel are committing whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Okay, so they're, they're basically committing fornication with Moab. And in verse 4, God, God's angry now. And he, he tells Moses he's supposed to take the heads of the people and he's supposed to hang them up before the Lord. Okay? And in verse 5, Moses tells the judges of Israel, he says, Slay ye every one of his men that were joined in the field for Peor. In other words, anyone that did that, that committed this fornication, that bowed down to their idols, they're supposed to kill them. I mean, this is their own people that are supposed to do that. And so the judgment is out. That's what they're supposed to do. And what does this guy Zimri do? In front of everybody, while people are weeping because of the judgment, that the people got to kill their own family. And, and, that, and I think probably at this point the plague has started and people are starting to die. And what does Zimri do? He goes and grabs this, this Cosby, or Cosby, this, this daughter of the Midianites, and he goes into to a tent so everybody can see what he's about to do. He's going to go to bed with this Cosby and commit fornication. And these people are weeping. But the good thing is there's Phinehas. Okay? Phinehas is the son of Eleazar, which was the son of Aaron the priest. Okay? So he was the, the grandson of Aaron, okay, Moses' brother. And he takes a javelin, it's like a spear, and he goes and he goes straight to the tent and uh, shish kebabs both of them. Uh, just, uh, right through both of them while they're laying there. And the Bible says, so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. So God liked the zeal of Phinehas to, to stop this wickedness and the, God stopped the plague. What does it say in verse 9? And those that died of the plague were 20 and 4,000. Just imagine, 24,000 people, boom, dying. That's a lot. So, Balak was, I think he was the king of Moab. And Moab, if, if you remember reading the story, Moab was actually one of the sons of Lot's daughters that Lot had with his daughter because he was drunk. And the, the Moabites, the, the, uh, the, the vexed the children of Israel through the history, and yeah, Balak was the son of Zippor, was the king of the Moabites. So that's who the Moabites were. They were from Lot. Okay, remember Lot went east. Um, went east, that was east. Abraham's going west, Lot's going to the east. Because there was, there, they had too many animals that they couldn't dwell together. Okay, when you run out of pasture, as your, as your herd grows, you need more and more pasture. So they couldn't live close together because they needed each pasture for, for their animals. So obviously Abraham, he had two children, right? He had Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac was the promised one. Isaac had two children, Jacob and Esau. Okay? But then, Abraham, after Sarah died, he married another person named Keturah. And Midian was one of those sons. And the Midianites is who we're, we're, we're going to bed with here, the daughters of Midian. Or the daughters of Moab, but, sorry, Zimri takes the Midianitish one. Okay, so it's like they're also living. Like, because Isaac got everything that Abraham owned, but Abraham gave gifts to the, the children of Keturah. And they, they, they went also to the east. So they went to where uh, the Moabites lived in that area. So it makes sense. It's talking about Moab and it's talking about Midianites. So they kind of live in the same area. And they, who knows, they might have become kind of like one people, like what they tried to do to the Israelites. But it's a good thing that the zeal of Finney has, he goes and, and stops that wickedness. And in verse 18, it says, For they vex you with their wiles, and wherewith they have the value in the matter of pure, and the matter of caused by the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the plague for pure's sake. So, Cosby was 
a daughter of a prince, like somebody important in the Midianites. So that is the matter of pure, what, what happened there. And the Bible brings it up quite often in, 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 in the Bible. And it, it's such a wickedness. And you know God hates it because he killed 24,000 people. And it, it, it's something really wicked. And that's the title of my message today, is The Matter of Peor. Okay? We should remember the matter of Peor to, to this day. And it's a good thing they had somebody like Phinehas that had the zeal. He killed those good people and stayed the plague. Now there's another Phinehas in the Bible. And he was one of the sons of Eli. And his brother's name was Hophni. And if you read this story, in 1 Samuel 2.22, it says, Now Eli was very old heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the one Phinehas, he stopped the fornication, and this other Phinehas, he was doing it right in front of the tabernacle of the congregation there in Shiloh. Two, two different guys with the same name, one is righteous, one was, the Bible calls him the son of Eliel. Turn to Numbers chapter 31. And uh, you might be wondering what, um, like where this word pure comes from. I don't really know, but it is interesting. In Numbers 23, 28. And Balak brought Balaam onto the top of Peor that looked at poor Jeshua. So Peor was, it sounds like a, a mountain, or at least, uh, if not a mountain range, one mountain. And it, it gets brought up in different places. In Deuteronomy, this story gets uh, brought up. For Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 3. Now therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that you may live, and go and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which you command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commands of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Pure, the Lord that God have destroyed them from among you. So even in Deuteronomy, he's, he's saying, keep the commandments of your, your Lord. Because he saw what happened to these people at Baal Pure, that you know, there's 24,000 that died. And, and just think of how many people 24,000 is. I think Winkler here has about 10,000 people. So that would be like Winkler and Morton plus some, okay, 24,000 people that die in a short period of time. Even in the Psalms it's mentioned, in Psalm 106, uh, 28-30, they joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked them to anger with their inventions and the plague break in upon them. Then stood up Phinehas and executed judgment and so the plague was stayed. The, the, here in, the, in Psalm it says they were eating the sacrifices of the dead. I don't know if that means they were worshipping dead people, but it's, it's interesting how these wicked religions that don't pretend to be Christians, I mean obviously there's wicked religions like the Catholics and stuff pretend to be uh, Christians, but how, how these like the Hindus and these different things, they have, to see, have this strange fascination with death. And so, but this could also be referred to just the dead as in they're unsaved people, they're, they're, they're dead and they're sacrificing to the idols. So part of the abomination that was done there, that Israel did, was eating things sacrificed to their idols, to what we know is, is not really a god at all. It's just, just a, a statue of some kind, either molten of metal, carved out of wood, whatever they do, right? Um, or even stone. But there is these false gods, any false god that people worship, there's a demon associated with it. And we know they're, they're worship, the Bible says that they're worshiping devils when they do this. Uh, if you're there in Numbers 31, so we read from uh, Numbers 25. Now this is a little bit further on in, in the history. It's still the general same time period. Numbers 31, and this is actually, Oh, well, let's just start in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. So this is the last battle that Moses will be involved in, because it says he'll be gathered unto his people. So, you know, fight this battle, and then Moses is going to die. 
Verse 3, Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. Of every tribe a thousand through it, all the tribes of Israel, Israel shall be sent to war. So in other words, there's 12,000, because there's 1,000 from every tribe, and there's 12 tribes. And, they, and Moses sends them to war, and Phinehas goes uh, with a trumpet and so on, and they fight against all the Midianites and kill all the males. But then look what happens in verse 9. They don't. Oh, actually, let's look back at verse 8 to, to find out something else interesting there. And they slew the kings of Midian, beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi and Rechem and Zur and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam, also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. So ba Balaam they killed with the sword. And he deserved to die. And, and you think, well, didn't he prophesy good about Israel? Why did he die? Well, God uses, in the, in the Old Testament, he uses different people. And the Spirit of God comes upon them, not in them. Like today, after the day of Pentecost, after Jesus was resurrected, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. But at that time, it came upon them. Okay, and and God would use people to prophesy that not necessarily were even saved people. Okay, and, and I think it's in, in Jude. Let's just quick, I'll just quickly look at Timothy if you want. I think, it, um, I think his name is mentioned in Jude too. He he kind of makes like the the hall of fame of false prophets. I think there's Korah, yeah, and Jude eleven. Woe unto them for they've gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished from the gainsaying of Cori. Korah, yeah, Korah, Cori. So Cain, Balaam, and Kor Korah, those three, they're mentioned in Jude. And it says, greedily after the error of Balaam. And Balaam was greedy, and, and he got the Moab to, to basically entice them to sin. So, before we get into what happened after this battle here. So, the king of Moab knew he couldn't defeat Israel. Because he had heard all these things that, that God had done for the children of Israel. You know, how the Egyptians drowned the Red Sea. And how the sea was parted. And all these miracles. And then he tries to get Balaam to curse him and curse him and curse him. Four times he blesses them. And... So he, he realizes this, and then when Balaam tells him, hey, how you win is to get God mad with them, okay? Now, the children of Israel were supposed to be a peculiar people. They were supposed to be sanctified. They were supposed to be set apart. Why were they the chosen people? They weren't just chosen people to have some special status, like, hey, we're the children of Israel. That's not why. They were chosen for a job. When you're chosen, you're chosen for a job. And they were chosen. They're supposed to be the oracle of God. They're supposed to show and tell people about their heavenly father. Okay? They're supposed to be evangelists, basically. Um, and, and we know that there's people that did become Jews throughout history. Okay? In the Old Testament. So there's some people that did get converted. But they weren't doing a very good job. And today, we got a job. We're, we're the chosen people now, too, because we're saved. But we have a job to do is to evangelize, to, to preach the gospel. And even though we're a relatively small group, we're getting things done. And how can the enemy, how can Satan slow us down or, or try to stop us? By getting us to be unholy, okay? If, if, if people among us would start to commit fornication, okay, and, and become unholy, you're not going to be as good as a soul winner when when you, you you're you're not sanctified. You're not set apart. You're not peculiar. If somebody sees you knock their door and oh, I know that guy. He 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 fools around with all all the women and things like that. Are they going to be really willing to listen to you? No, because because they think you're just like everybody else. And so Satan could. Um, use one of his wiles and, and, and try to bring enmity between us and God. Like that, Obviously, the wrath of God isn't going to come upon us because we're saved, but we won't have that sweet fellowship. And this is what, what, what happened in 
And what there is that, hey, you want to defeat these people, get them to you know, fornicate with your, your daughters and come to their, your feasts where they're sacrificing unto their idols, and God's going to get mad at them, and then you could defeat them. And luckily, the, uh, you know, obviously God sent a plague to put a stop to it, and Phinehas goes and, and spears those two people that were in defiance, they're trying to provoke. It's like they're just, just like these pride people today, they're trying to provoke God. And so getting back to this battle here, so they sent 12,000 people, they slew all these, slew, but it says slew all the males. But look at verse 9. And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones and took the spoil of all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods, and they burnt all their cities wherein they dwelt and all their goodly castles with fire. And they took all the spoil and all the prey, both of men and, and of beasts. So this is not what they were supposed to do. Verse 12, And they brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and Eliezer the priest, and unto the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by Jordan near Jericho. And Moses and Eliezer the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. And Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. And Moses said unto them, have you saved all the women alive? He's mad. Wrath just is like a past tense of, of or a form of wrath. Okay? It means he's angry. He's very angry. And what does he say in verse 16? Behold, these, he's saying, these women, behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam. What's counsel of Balaam? Advice. Advice of Balaam. Balaam told them to do it. He says, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. He's saying, that We had a plague, and now you guys are saving those women alive? They're the ones that caused you to commit trespass through the counsel of Balaam. Okay, that, yeah, it starts out with fornication, and then they go to these feasts where they're worshiping the idols, and God is mad at them and slew 24,000 of them. And no wonder Moses is getting mad. And he gets mad over and over because it's like one step forward, two steps back. It, 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 you could just imagine how frustrated Moses was. With all these miracles that had happened, and then they do it. They just learned 24,000 people don't commit fornication. And what do they do? They save the women a lot. And these are the ones that cause them to turn to false gods. So this is Old Testament, right? Well, let's look at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Last book in your Bible. It should be easy to flip it. Revelation chapter 2. Verse, starting verse 12. And the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things say he which hath a sword, sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwells, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelt. Now listen to this. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So here's where it says black and white. And actually, my Bible is red and white because this is um, highlighted because of the words of Christ. And he's saying it was Balaam who taught Balak. Balak didn't figure this out on himself. He taught him to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel so that they would eat things sacrificed unto idols and they would commit fornication. So we, we see this coming up over and over again in the Bible, and not just with Baal Pure, this warning about not committing fornication, it just comes over and over and over. Obviously, they shouldn't have worshipped their the false gods, that's right. But how do you think they got into that? Do you think that was a draw when they saw these people sacrificing to their false gods? Maybe it was to them, I don't know, because they worshipped a golden calf at one point. But 
I think they're more enticed by the women, okay? And then that's that was the bait and, and to get it to the trap of fornication and uh, worshiping idols. So, and, and some people will think, well, the fornication part, that wasn't really the, the, the significant part, that wasn't really the big deal. Um, but I, I think it is. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6. Especially nowadays, right? Like it, uh, it's not even an embarrassment anymore if, if somebody becomes pregnant out of wedlock, right? It's not even a shame if somebody goes to bed. That's what fornication is. is when somebody goes to bed with someone they're not married to, okay, before they're married. Now, if one or the other is married, then it's, caused, uh, it's called adultery. Okay, so it's not even a shame anymore. It happens. Over and over again, of course, nowadays we use contraception. But over and over again, there's somebody that's born out of wedlock. And what does the Bible call that person? It's a bastard. Somebody that's, that's, that's born to somebody who is not married. That's called a bastard child. And you're going to uh, 1 Corinthians 6. But in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 8, it's, there's another warning. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. God killed twenty-three thousand in one day. This is what he thinks of fornication. You think, well, didn't it say twenty-four thousand in the Old Testament? Now this is twenty-three thousand. See, there's an error in the King James Bible. No, there isn't. The other place it says twenty-four thousand people died of the plague. Here it says in one day twenty-three thousand people died. That means a thousand of them just died in a different day. Okay, especially the biblical day, a new one starts at sundown. Okay, so 23,000 died and another thousand probably died after sundown or something like that. So it's not here. That is right. But it's a warning. He doesn't even bring up about the idols. Obviously that was wicked. He says Let's not commit fornication because 23,000 people died on one day. That's what God thinks of fornication. And even when um, after, after all, basically all of Israel is conquered, like when Joshua is with them and you know the, the people go back to the other side, remember it's like two and a half tribes, um, I think it was half tribe of Manasseh, and then there was. Uh, I, I, I would just be guessing. But anyway, they're, they're going back to their half, okay? And they build this altar on the border. And they're building it so that their children will remember, hey, that we're part of those other people on the other side of the river. But then, then the other people think, well, they're starting to worship false gods, and they come. And they bring up this whole thing of this matter, pure, and saying how God. Um, it says, is the iniquity pure too little for us from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord? So they're even using, at that time, which is many years after, there's the same hate. Don't well, you remember pure? Why, why are you guys building this altar? And then, of course, later they explain it. No, it's. It's so that we won't forget about God, not that we're worshiping other gods. So it gets brought up again. But if you're in there in 1 Corinthians 6, let's look at what it says there. It says in verse 13, Meats for the belly and the belly for the for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Okay? So you think of it that way. It's like, you are the members of Christ. You don't go and join with, with somebody that's not your wife. By going to the bedroom and doing those things that are reserved for marriage. Okay? He says, you don't take the members of Christ and make them the members of the harlot. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Verse 18, it says, flee fornication. That means run away, run the other way. What did Joseph do? 
His master's wife tried to get him to commit fornication, and he ran. She grabbed his clothes. He left his, his jacket or whatever it was behind and just left. She used, tried to use that as evidence later, but he, flew, he fled fornication. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. So our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, okay? And we should treat it as such. We should not, you know, get the temple tattooed up. We shouldn't get it, you know, perforated and put all kinds of metal in different places like that. But we should also not use the temple to commit fornication. You're sinning against your own body and like I said before, we shouldn't make members of Christ the members of an harlot. So, with the matter of pure, we understand that God hates fornication, okay? And that the people die. And obviously, he doesn't just kill everybody that, that commits fornication nowadays, okay? He wants people to learn and make their own decisions. But how, how, how does somebody stop from doing fornication? How, how, how do you avoid that? Well, if you, you live in the spirit, you won't live in the flesh. That's a good start. And if we keep reading in the next chapter, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Now concerning the things where you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Okay, so you're saying, to avoid fornication, get married. Okay, well, not everybody's old enough to get married, and not to that point, you haven't found a woman. Okay, but that, the, the world will tell you, no, you should wait to get married. First, experience the, the, this world, and, and live, travel, and, and do different things. And then, once you're older, then marry, get married. But no, the Bible says to avoid fornication, everybody should let every man have his own wife. And then, in verse 7, of 1 Corinthians 7, it says, For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And he's not saying burning in hell, that means rather than burning in lust, get married. So people will think, well, if you get married, you're ruining your life, you've got a ball and chain, uh, you know, your options are, are destroyed. But it, it's not that at all. And and Paul's saying people should get married unless you know they, they can contain and they want to just serve God full time. But most people, they, they're not. They're, that's not how their makeup is. They they need to get married because they cannot contain. It's better to marry than to burn and lust. And over and over again, um, Galatians, Ephesians, like Colossians, just talks about fornication. Ephesians 5, 3, But fornication and all cleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become the saints. In Colossians it says, When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon earth. Fornication. So it says mortify. It means to kill or to make dead. Fornication is the first one he brings up. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God come upon the children of disobedience. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the will 4 verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. That, man, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. So what this is saying is, we should know how to possess 
our vessel in sanctification and honor. And our vessel is our body, okay? We're not, this, this vessel we have here isn't what we're going to have for eternity. We're going to get a, a new body. And, but he says we should, we should possess it in holiness and in sanctification and honor. So sanctification, that is to become holy, to be set apart. We shouldn't be like everybody else. And we shouldn't make the members of Christ the members of an harlot. So we should be set apart. So, how do you avoid fornication? Well, one is you can get married. But the other thing is, don't even look at things that are going to tempt you, okay? In Psalm 101, verse 3, it says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside, but shall not cleave to me. And nowadays, that is just pushed and pushed and pushed, and now it's gotten even worse. It's not even just fornication they're trying to get you to do. It's, it's wicked filth of sodomy. And it's in Hollywood, it's in the movies, it's in television, it's in the music, it's in magazines, it's on billboard. Women that aren't dressed properly. And even not now disgusting, it's starting to come with men. It's, it's just wicked. And as, as living in the world, we can't avoid it. We're going to see things like that. But the thing is, we don't take the second look, okay? You saw it, you don't oh, get curious and look. because. Well, let's read what it says in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So there's a process. You see your life, you think about it, and then you do it. Okay? If you don't take that second look, you're not going to be thinking of it as, as, as easily. In Proverbs 6, Verse 24 to 29, it says, To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by the means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious light. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals, and his feet not be burned? So he that toucheth he, so he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. You're playing with fire, with adultery, with fornication. Now, I've been talking about fornication. That's the unmarried people. But the, a lot of these things can apply to adultery, to mar married people, okay? We have to watch out too. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, it says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. So we shouldn't even be, put ourselves into situation so it looks like we're doing evil, okay? I'm not going to go on a road trip with a different woman that's not my wife, okay? Even if nothing happens the whole trip, what what are people going to say? You're, you have that appearance of evil. And we, we don't want to put ourselves in situations where where we could fall into temptation, okay? You're, one of you guys aren't going to go um, camping with a bunch of girls, okay? that there's no chaperone and, and there's you know not separation and so on because not only does that have the appearance of evil the temptation is there okay it, and it seems like it's happening earlier and earlier even from my own experience and I think this was just joking but when I was in high school one of my sister's friends comes up to me and one she's asking me to marry her and, and, and it's like she was uh, she was joking but why was she doing that? Because she had already committed fornication, and she was pregnant, and she wanted to have a husband. And I think she was just joking about it, but still, at this early age, she was in grade 9. Okay, I, and I don't know what age grade 9s are, probably like 14 or something like that. Okay, and she's already going to have a baby soon. We, we shouldn't have this attitude that it can't happen to us. We've got to be on the on the watch, on the lookout, things like that can happen to us, okay? And because we have the benefit, you, especially you young people, you have the benefit now of good preaching, okay? And I don't mean just from this book, but I'm talking about on the internet, just good preachers that preach hard against fornication. You have this warning, and now because to whom much is given, to whom is much required, okay? You have this preaching, and you can get even more punishment chastisement because you knew that ahead of time. And don't think 
it won't happen to me, okay? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Take heed means be warned. Okay? You think you're standing. You can't go into church and go and soul winning. It can't happen to me. You get in a situation alone with a, a woman, the temptation could happen. And just remember what God thinks of, of fornication. He killed 24,000, 23,000 in one day, but 24,000 total. He does not like it. And, he, and because you're saved, you're not a bastard, you're a son, he chastises every son, okay? But in verse 13, after it says that, in 12 it says, Wherefore let him that think if he sits down and take heed lest he fall. 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you that such is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay, so God is going to make a way out out of temptation. So don't give in to temptation. And, and also in a different place it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, you've got to resist this. Now, I know that men are more susceptible and more tempted by this sin, okay, of, of going to bed with a woman before you're married to her. That doesn't mean that, that women aren't tempted at all. That doesn't mean that. But men have more of a tendency to that. But as a woman, okay, as a young lady, you have a part in it too. Matthew 5, 27 says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Verse 28, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now this is talking about adultery. But if you lust after a woman, you've already committed fornication in your heart. Okay? If you're not married. So the woman's part also is to dress modestly. Okay? Don't, don't bring attention to your body. In, um, in the Old Testament Exodus, it, in 2842, it explains how to cover your nakedness. It says, from the loins even to the thighs shall, shall they reach. So in no case should any skirt or dress come above the knee. Okay? That, that's covering your nakedness, the Bible says. Now, covering your nakedness is not enough. You should also be dressed modestly. Okay? You shouldn't be in, in skin-tight clothing. Or, or low-cut tops or anything like that. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with voided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Okay? So you, you shouldn't dress to bring attention to yourself. That should not be your... Uh, and don't get me wrong. It's good to dress up, it's good to, to dress well, but you shouldn't be dressing that is immodest, okay, that is too tight, it's, it's, it's bringing attention to your body. And the other thing is, like, girls sometimes, especially young women and even older ones, they want that attention from men, right? Yeah, you, you want a, a, attention, but not that kind of attention, because just think of it, you, you get a guy, and I'm talking to the ladies now, you get a guy like that, that's attracted to your body, what's he going to be like when he gets married? You, you won't want that kind of guy that's just looking at other women all the time? No, you don't. You, you want to rather attract a guy with what's inside of you. Obviously, God's giving you beauty and there's nothing wrong with that, but the, you, you should, and guys, don't, this is a warning to you too, don't just be attracted to, to a, a pretty woman. You, you should be beautiful on the inside too. So somebody that is saved, that you're not unequally yoked, somebody that's as zealous as you are for God, you don't want to, you're unequally yoked if you're married to an unbeliever. But you're not quite equally yoked either if somebody just barely saved and doesn't want to go to church and not train up your children in the way of the Lord. That's still not a, a, a balanced yoke. Okay, and remember with the yoke, two oxen pulling a yoke, you got to pull it the same, same amount or one's just dragging the other one behind. So, women, yeah, also don't commit fornication, but also don't advertise what's not for sale.
okay? A harlot, a tired and harlot, will advertise us for sale. So, just to review what we talked about, and actually there's one I didn't even talk about, and that's, be careful who you hang out with, okay? Don't hang out with people that think it's okay to fornicate. Don't hang out with girls that are dressed slutty, okay? That are dressed with the attire of an harlot. Don't hang out with people that talk about fornication, that have filthy jokes. Like John and Dad and Amnon, okay? You remember that story? Amnon was in, he had, basically he had a case on his sister. It was only his half sister, but still. He, he wanted his sister, but he thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But the problem is, he had this, this friend named Jonadab, and he basically convinces him, hey, why don't you pretend you're sick and get your sister to come and, and, and bring you food, and then, then you can do something. And it's, it's wicked. Now, if Amnon didn't have such a wicked friend, then maybe nothing would ever happen. Okay? So don't hang out with wicked people. But the first thing is, don't even look at stuff like that. Okay? You see it, don't, don't look at it again, don't think about it, because things that you think about, eventually you're probably going to do. And don't get this attitude that because we're Baptists, we're not going to fall into traps, okay? Take heed, the person that stands, take heed lest you fall, right? And don't get into situations that could compromise you. Don't play with fire. Don't think, well, I'm strong enough to handle this girl's flirting with me. I can, I can just kind of play along and nothing's going to happen. No. You want to wait till we're married. Don't be like Esau, okay? Esau sold his birthright. He couldn't wait for, for the reward, okay? He he sold his birthright for some some cottage. Like, what is that? Like, the lentils? I don't know. Is that some, some kind of stew? Is it whatever? Even if it was the best tasting stew or porridge in the world, wasn't worth selling his birthright. And, and of course, ladies and guys, dress modestly not to, to get attention to your body. And be sanctified and fill your mind with holy things. Live in the spirit, and then we won't live in the flesh. Last, last verse, uh, passage I'll read to you. Hebrews 12, 15, 17. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. When the Bible says meat, it means food. It doesn't mean like muscles from an animal. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So it, afterwards, after he sold his birthright, he, he, he cried about it. He, he was sad that he had done it. But it was too late. After you commit fornication, it's too late. You already ruined your life. Okay? And ruined the your relationship of your future spouse. So don't be like Esau. Obviously, when it, it says a fornicator like Esau, I don't think that means that Esau committed fornication. It just means that Esau didn't wait for his reward. So don't do things like this. We want to live holy. And don't think because we're Baptists that things like that can happen to us. Let's pray.